It's DD on the spot. Welcome to another episode of DD on the spot. As always, I'm your host Ryan Johnson, and before I get to my band here today, I'd like to remind everyone to please like and subscribe down below. We greatly appreciate it. They're near Austin, Texas. I would like to point that out. They're about an hour away from it. But uh, if you're in the Texas area, you might have already heard of these guys. Um, Astriction. Uh, they are a band from, uh, like I said, the Texas area, and they, we are glad to have them on the show. Gentlemen, why don't you guys go around and introduce yourselves and uh, let us know kind of what inspired you and how you guys formed this band. Uh, my name is Donovan, and I play the drums. My name is Rico. I do guitar and vocals. My name is... Joe, and I also do guitar. I'm Justin. I play bass. All right. So now, who was the main catalyst behind the band forming? Or was it more than one of you guys? Um, literally, uh, around its conception, it was about 50-50 uh, Donovan and I. We had bumped into each other at uh, the local guitar center in Colleen off of Los Boulevard. And uh, he was in the drum room. I was in the guitar room. We were doing two totally separate things, just doing our own thing we didn't have we didn't know each other past that and then we just started playing uh your betrayal by both my valentine we both just so happened to play it at the same time and uh we actually started jamming from halfway across the store and we were just cranking it up and annoying the heck out of everyone right <laughs> and as soon as we finished he approached me and he's like hey man are you in a band and i was like no he's like well you're in one now <laughs> yep and he brought Toby along. Toby has been with us since the beginning, and we have had a lot of uh, lineup changes in terms of uh, other guitarists, rhythm guitarists. So we finally got Joe after a lot of trial and error. He was a Craigslist find, by the Ooh. way. Imagine that. <laughs> that is the fifth time that we've had a Craigslist person on, and I kept saying to everyone, I never had heard that before, and I was like, you guys are going to get murdered. Watch out. But I guess I guess it works out for some people. So, I mean, like I've said on the other podcast, if you're going to go to Craigslist, make sure that you be careful about it, but it can be a way to get your bandmates. He was also on Backpage, but we found him on Craigslist. We yeah, did. Yeah, yeah that's very true. <laughs> I, was, uh, I had gotten back from a deployment, and I uh, was looking for fast cash. No, but... <laughs> <laughs> Need cash no. now. I realized I wanted to be in a band for like a long time because I my guitar playing had gotten stale. I was just like, I, I need to play in a band if I want to get better because I always wanted to be in a band. So I posted an ad on Craigslist of me like on stage playing like The Offspring or something. <laughs> and like they sent me a video of them playing uh, like a Five Finger Death Punch cover and then Bullet for My Valentine. And I was like, I fucking love Bullet for My Valentine. So, <laughs> what yeah, Offspring was, song were you playing? It, they were playing Your Betrayal. Oh, yeah. In Austin, Texas. It was like a cell phone video. But I was like, hey, they actually sound good. <laughs> now, when you were doing the Craigslist, you didn't tell them that like, you're going to have to meet behind like a garage someplace or like in the middle of an alley somewhere and just like don't don't bring any like cell phones I, or anything. This is... <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> I, was very, I was very paranoid when I showed up. They could obviously tell. Oh, yeah. Was... Yeah, we, yeah, we definitely had a little fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um... All, all, um, we auditioned him in about two, three, about two practices, three practices, and, and then finally we were like, hey, man, we really like you. Oh, by the way, we have to play with Motor Grader in two weeks. <laughs> Half five songs down. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty crazy. But, hey, he got it. He got it, and he's been with us ever since. All right. So when you guys were starting as a band, was there a specific genre that you guys knew that you wanted to play, or was there like a discussion when you guys were forming as to um, what type of music you wanted to play? Um, that's actually a good question, because I think when we actually first started out as a band to get familiar with each other, we just kind of played a, a pretty diverse range of covers. Um, I think we had some, uh, of course, Five Finger Death Punch, Bullet of My Valentine, but then we also had Limp Bizkit. Then we had Rage Against the Machine. We and, did Limp Bizkit. Yeah, right. we did Limp Bizkit. And then uh, after a while, we were we just kind of uh, sort of wanted to form a blanket genre, right? So you know how like metal is like such a huge genre now, and every everyone's all nitpicky with the subgenres. We're just like we're gonna throw a blanket over the entire metal <laughs> genre and see if we can get everything, right? So we're just like whatever comes to mind, as long as it's metal, it doesn't matter, right? Yeah, that's on the bar, right? Now this is for this is for each and every one of you guys. Was there ever a moment when um? when you were like young or whatever, was there a specific song that you first heard like on the radio and you're like, oh my God, I need to get into music after you heard this song? Did that? Did any of that happen to you guys? And if so, what was the song? I think for me, I before I'd even played guitar, it was Everlong by the Foo Fighters. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but like that song just resonated with me so hard. I was like, I need to learn that on guitar. 
That was probably like the first song I ever heard that was like, I want to play music now. Yeah. I don't know why. I heard it on the radio. If you want to get super obscure, that video, his cover video is on YouTube. Oh, God. Ooh. <laughs> you want to see his very first guitar video. That's cover. not even Digging right, Digging into the man. vault. You, you guys are going to send me the link to that, and I'm going to put the link below so everyone that watches this can go check oh, it out. Uh, <laughs> enjoy the obscure. <laughs> I grew up with, like, 80s hair metal, so I just kind of all over the place. But, yeah, rap is my biggest fan. Heck, nice. yeah. No, you're also into like Lamb of God, and Five Finger. Lamb of God, yeah. Funny enough, I yeah, I, I actually uh, not only did you find me at Guitar Center, but not too long after that, I followed up and saw you at the drum off that they had at Guitar Center. The uh, it was like what was it, just store region, yeah, the and then store, it was state. Yeah, yeah. And it's I'm pretty, made pretty, it to Dallas, and that was that was pretty fun. That was fun. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, but this guy's all over the place. Um, I don't, I don't know, Toby. What are your influences? Oh. I know he was also at. Toby was in an acoustic group yep. called Sabridge before yeah, he was kinda with us. Died in the last couple months, did a local show, and then just went nowhere. But influence wise, you know, I was a kid, maybe 14, 15, and I would first seen the Slipknot Duality music video. Oh, and that, yes. that, that was, that got me all the way into metal. I was a Linkin Park kid before that. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that just did it right there for me. It was been downhill ever since <laughs> yeah, yeah. you mean uphill <laughs> okay so this next question goes to donovan donovan being the drummer we all have talked to multiple drummers on this show and we kind of get the whole gist of how the drums are kind of the backbone of the band i mean you keep the beat and you're they basically rely on you in order to have a successful melody during the show do you feel that added pressure during the shows and if you do what are there what ways do you use to kind of ease off the pressure a little bit uh, I don't feel any type of pressure on stage. I mean, aside from we get on stage, we want to, I mean, of course, we want to impress everybody there. We want people to know that they came to a fucking restriction show. You know, they didn't just come see a metal band. So everybody in the group, of course, does something other than play their instrument. You know, everybody here does vocals. Um, so it, it took me a long time to be able to do vocals as well as play and keep up with this fucking guy over here because the stuff he writes is not normal it's not human <laughs> so, but as far as pressure i mean i don't feel any type of you know um it's a good word like independent strain you know it's like this is on me or this is we're all relying on you i don't feel any type of that because we just go as one unit i mean we're one band it's one show and it's one good time so yeah, oh, yeah. and this guy's a monster on the metronome too <laughs> and we can play to a click live a lot of bands i found out do not play to a metronome when we do yeah, and Donovan, does um, what is what would you say is probably the biggest misconception that people have in general who aren't in the music scene about drummers? Um, biggest misconception is that we're either rich or that we're just. I mean, our home we're hometown heroes. I mean, it's just not. I can go to Walmart and people look at me like, who's this fucking guy? He's got tattoos. <laughs> 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 no, I mean it's and that we're all skinny. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing about it again, though, I mean, it's a position where you're constantly in motion. So, I mean, that that is probably a stereotype that you'd think would be true. But it's trust me, out of all the guys I've interviewed, that is that is not the case. So, so okay. So now this goes to the redhead stepchild of the band, Toby, the bassist. <laughs> <laughs> now, Toby. We all know that bassists get a lot of crap because people always. I mean, you guys, your position is one of, is one that you really need to like be in the music scene to really appreciate what the bass player does. But uh, was that hard for you starting out to kind of realize that you would be in a role that maybe like as when it comes to audience mem audience wise and kind of recognition wise, you might not get the same attention as other people in the band. Um, no, not really, not for me. I'm a real socially awkward person i don't like people so <laughs> kind of like you know hi have a it have a good day but <laughs> as far as the role in the band it's just everything works perfectly well for me it was never really a an issue of people coming up oh man you're awesome thank you <laughs> <laughs> Is there any type of specific uh preparation that you go through as the bass player like before shows in order to get yourself ready um just do vocal warm up on the way to the show, stretching my fingers out, and that's really about it. All right. 
Yeah. Right, yeah, we've had a lot of bass players on here, and everyone always likes to give them crap. But I do like to mention, as a disclaimer here, that bass players are hugely important to the band. They keep most of the rhythm down for the guitar player, and they really help the guitar players flourish. So everyone, let's all give a little appreciation to the bass player, because bass players are severely under... Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now you can go back to being irrelevant, now that we got that out of the way. But, uh... <laughs> all right, Justin and Rico, we got the two guitar players. Did you guys, when you guys were, um, when you guys first came together as a band, did you guys have difficulty kind of mixing your sounds together? Did you guys have different sort of uh, ways of playing the guitar, and how'd that work out? I think, like, yeah, we definitely had vastly different uh, styles of music that we were influenced by. He's been more influenced by, like, I guess, prog? Or... Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely into the more progressive stuff and a lot of the weird, genty metalcore. I've just kind stuff, of messing around all that like stuff. Like, tapping. Like, for me, I was I was influenced by, like, Metallica, uh, a lot of punk-style bands. Like I gotta like, say, uh, Master I... of Puppets is my one song that got me into metal, and that's my fav- that might be one of my favorite songs of all time. So that's when I got into the whole metal scene. But please continue. I always add that disclaimer every time we bring it up just because it's such a great song that I got to give it a plug. Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely Master of Puppets is definitely, like, something, a notch to have on your belt when you're just learning songs Mm -hmm. and playing guitar. Mm -hmm. But, like, I think when I came into the band, the way, the mindset that I had is, like, I wanted to get better. So I kind of just had him kind of take the lead and, like, I just wanted to absorb, like, new guitar stuff that I had nothing, I had no idea. I never knew how to tap or or freaking gent or any of that kind of stuff. So <laughs> and learning just learning the set list like of restriction just made me better in general with all the like ninth chords and ninth yeah, like bar ninth chords, all that crazy stuff. I just wanted to learn and I was just hungry. So I think like over time we kinda just like learned off of each other a lot. Like how we play and stuff. Like we're really good friends too, so it helps. So like, we always want to hang out and just seeing the new stuff that we that we learning or we're coming up with. I mean what do you think? Well, um, yeah, for me, it was uh, it was about the same. I felt like uh, because this guy's a very fast learner, right? Joe's a very fast learner, so that was the whole reason why, you know, as we mentioned before, in about two weeks' time, he went from knowing absolutely nothing to knowing the whole set enough to still have us stay on schedule in terms of our shows. So, you know, he really rose up to the challenge with that, and and uh, he, he's. Even though he's even though he's not too confident in his abilities, and he should be because he's actually really good, right? <laughs> but um, it's just uh, once we started getting to really mesh with each other, then you start to see you know eye to eye. And, and the cool thing is, him and I, and uh, even the rest of us, don't just listen to metal. And I think that's a very important thing. Is there's a lot of influence you can always take from everything. You know, like I was a choir kid. So, mm-hmm. you know, in high school, I was the, you know, I wanted to be the, the choir kid, do all the contests, look at me, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I, I hit a bench sevenfold, and, and then it just all went down slash uphill from there. And especially with guitar, I, I, uh, I don't know why. Some people want to, you know, take a song that they really like that seems simple enough to get the gist of in like a week. I wanted to punish myself. So I was literally like, P90Xing these fingers. <laughs> and I'm not saying I'm like super talented or anything like that, but I feel like I've got a pretty good handle on what I wanted to do. We could always improve, but you know. And at least from that three second sound bit that you just gave us, if this band doesn't work out, you can always be an opera singer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> always an option. Fall yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, Rico, when Justin was kind of still in a little bit of the learning process of learning some things, did you find that kind of teaching him some of the stuff or having seeing him learn that stuff in front of you, did that also maybe help you kind of refresh on a lot of things on being a guitar player and his learning kind of helped you with your guitar playing as well? You know, what's funny is when you, when you think about it, um, and, and on the flip side of that, for some odd reason, I don't really like the mindset that a lot of people think that that's a hassle right Mm -hmm. because people do have different learning curves and can pick things up a lot quicker than most so sometimes sometimes if you just you know give a diamond a little bit of love and polish up the rough edges you know you can get a priceless gem you know and uh that's just i mean like i said you were you know you were good you were good on your own merit to begin with but you've gotten a lot better he's he was a diamond in the rough and he's a priceless gem right now we wouldn't give him up but um for me i definitely got to learn uh some of the crutches that some people can develop and and uh these weird little, especially for vocals as well, we all have these little ticks 
and little cheat things that we do that actually end up hurting us more than they help us. And if we break that, you know, I was able to see for at least guitar how some of them worked, and then we were able to go from there. Of course, you know, there was a little bit of butting heads because of the, you know, just the climb up. You know, the destination still seemed pretty dang far away, and he has threatened to, uh, uh, to put a PG, beat the snot out of me a couple times, right? <laughs> I was going to say, when you said butted heads, I was like, okay, we all know Justin's going to win this fight, okay? I saw you guys standing yep. up next to each yep. other. It's, yep. a, it's yep. a done deal. Yeah. He just wrecked me. Joe yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, when you guys... One of the things that I found out when I started this podcast is that uh, I'm for everyone that already hasn't seen seen this podcast. I'm right in the Minneapolis area, and there's a huge metal scene there. I would have never guessed it. I found that out by starting out with a lot of Minneapolis bands. But um, you guys are somewhat close to the Austin area. What would you describe the the scene like or the genre that really is um, dominant in the, the Austin, Texas area? Not definitely not metal. Yeah, some um, Austin's more of like a liberal hippie. Mm-hmm. hippie liberal city so all the metal bands pretty much all know each other all oh, within our them. within our niches so like if you have like i guess i'm just gonna throw one out there sludge metal they would all know all the sludge metal guys and all the like more melodic metal guys would know all the melodic metal guys it's like a big high school kind of niche thing. thing it's like yeah. Where, where yeah. Do you, yeah where do you sit at in the cafeteria yeah where do you thing. sit at in the cafeteria kind of thing <laughs> yeah now for like because Texas is so big, there's so many. Obviously, Austin's got the music capital of the world thing going on. So there's a lot of different bands there. It's just completely oversaturated. But with metal, I think in Texas it's more centralized. In Dallas, in San Antonio, in Houston because it's just the biggest city here. But definitely Dallas and San Antonio. Yeah, um, and of course that's that's not to discredit Austin for uh for the scene itself. There are still a lot of good bands that come through here. There's a lot of good acts in Austin. Honestly, like, you could literally turn the corner off of any street, just throw a stone, hit a musician, and figure out what they do, and you're already collaborating. It's, it's and that. So yeah. oversaturated is kind of like a bad, and it's a good, right? It's, it's bad because we all fight for the same thing, and when you start fighting for the same thing, you start becoming more competitive rather than collaborative. I like to work together. I don't like to butt heads with the bands around me because if we did work together, we could build everything up. You know, we and the people who come to see are the scene, Mm -hmm. you know, and if we don't help each other out, then we stay stagnant, you know, and And that's, that's pretty much how it runs. And being that you guys were in a genre starting out that wasn't as popular as some other genres, did you guys find it difficult to kind of, uh, get your name out there? I think what, what helped us is what pretty much Rico was just saying, like, no matter what genre or music that you play, whenever we go play a show, we make friends with everybody of every different genre, of every band. We want to be friends with everybody. So I think at first it was, like, rough, but, like, it's it's crazy, like, how over time it kind of just built upon itself. So, like, we, we it's not as bad as it used to be. It's honestly, it's it's kind of flourishing, in yeah. my opinion. We, oh, yeah. um, in our hometown, we did have a little bump in the road here and there, because especially in Colleen, Fort Hood, Copper's Cove, this entire little Fort Hood-esque area, right, Um, we have people from like all over the world, you know, it's one of the biggest military bases in the United Mm -hmm. States, but like the music scene is very scarce. There's not a whole lot of venues that we're really investing into it because unfortunately, especially since a lot of these businesses were like mom and pop owned, small chain, they don't want to take big risks, understandable. And that's what music is. Uh, uh, They rely on a band to bring pretty much everything in terms of a pool on that specific night. And And if they don't do it, they don't make nothing. And you get that enough, shut you down. So for Colleen, not a whole lot of venues were open to the idea. There was only one, and we had to build that up from the ground. There was one before, but, you know, some stuff happened with that. Um, so it was just really hard for us to really nail a consistent, you know, stream of Colleen music. Not even for just metal, just, just for all the music in general. Mm-hmm. Now, we did just have a headliner at a... Will call. It's like this uh, this bar right next to Wild Country off of this street called Veterans Memorial Downtown. Um, no one's ever played there. It was it, it was supposed to be built as a music venue before it changed its name like three times, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there was a there was a section on the side, and we approached them, and of course, as the story goes, with these uh, these guys randomly approaching you, That's saying, "Hey, 
we want to play at your show. We also want money and we want to make sure you make money. And they're just like, oh, you're just a bunch of kids. Get out of my face, right? <laughs> so, of course, they had that mentality. That's pretty common around here. But once we proved ourselves, kind of like how Joe was saying, mm -hmm. right? Once we proved that we could bring the draw and that, you know, they could make their money and everyone would have a good time and there'd be no, you know, shenanigans, especially since, like, you know, they were such a small establishment and a lot of loud noise makes them uh, uh, makes them subject to getting, you know, noise violation and stuff like that. So he really liked how things went, and now all of a sudden more venues want to do it. You know, now we're building it back up, but we're, we're trying to keep a closely knit community with all the musicians here to make that happen. Besides being, like, nice to everyone that you see at your concerts, is there any um, techniques or any tricks that you guys like to use in order to appeal to a more wider audience, uh, kind of bring fans from multiple genres in? Don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. Yeah, don't get drunk. Do. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't, do, don't get – none of us in the band really drink. None of us – definitely none of us do drugs. Yeah. So we're very, yeah. we're very easy going. And the fact that we grew up listening to so many styles of music, it's so easy for us to approach people Relate to of anybody. different backgrounds. Somebody be like, hey, man, I grew up with the Eagles. We're like, oh, no shit. Hey, man, I grew up with Slayer. Mm -hmm. Right on, you know, so we can just kind of bring whoever in and, you know. Yeah. I think what uh, – I guess our trick is kind of like just be friends, like just try to meet and talk to people that you would meet and talk with in any other situation and just, I don't know, just be cool. Just don't be a, a, an a-hole. We want to treat you like a friend, not a fan. Yeah, pretty much. We just just want to be friends with people. Exactly. And it's just, you just have, need to make that one connection and then everything can start falling into place. I mean, I found that same thing out here with the podcast. You just get one person on here and then they can spread the word. And then next thing you know, you know, you're on your 31st episode, just like we are right now. So it's just all about, you know, it's being nice. I mean, one thing I found through all this is that people are generally nice. You just got to ask them and you just got to be able to have a little bit of people skills and, you know, you, you're good. Yeah. Worked out for you, didn't it, Toby? Yeah. One, <laughs> one, thing, one thing that I can also mention is, you know, for some bands, there is this, you know, every band has, like, their, their gimmick. If they create a certain uh, image, they have to uphold that. But one thing that uh, I've definitely picked up from all of this experience, plus, you know, reading a couple books, this guy started it. Now I can't stop. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Ari Hurston. Um, Ari Hurston. Shout out to Ari Hurston, right? Um, is, is interacting in every way, shape, and form in the first person. Not too entirely informal, but enough to show some of your character. So, like, it may seem goofy, and I know it probably seems dumb and unprofessional, but I like to show my goofiness on stage and off stage. Whenever I'm at a show, whatever I would normally be with these guys in this room, you know, I would be at a at a show, you know, with however many people. It doesn't matter how, right? I'd just be, you know, just a regular old goofball. I don't want to be like, oh, I'm serious. I'm in a band. He wants respect. <laughs> We don't play music to you. Well, no, we will play music at you. No, like I think like what's really worked out for us is that we all try to be as authentic as possible. We don't try to act like we're like crazy rock stars. We just try to be really cool, courteous, pro professional in a sense. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it works out for us. Yeah. So um, one we like to talk about kind of the lyrics and how you guys come up with your music lyrically. Who writes most of the lyrics in the band, or is it a joint effort? Rico? Okay. Mostly me. Mostly me. All right, Rico, how do you get your influences for your lyrics? Is it kind of day-to-day -day stuff? Like people might be talking something in the street and you're like, oh, that's really cool. I could use it. Is it stuff that you might hear on TV or is it – We've always, I've always got to ask this question because we're waiting for one guy to say yes, but there's always that movie trope where the, where the guy's having a dream and then the dream he's like, you must use these lyrics for the perfect melody or whatever. And the guy wakes up. He's like, oh, my God, i got to write that down. This is the perfect song ever. Has that ever happened to you? And uh, how, do you, how do you come up with your lyrics mainly? Okay, for that little quip, yes, but not lyrics, it was a melody. Ooh. Oh, really? And that melody ended up becoming Breaking the Silence. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. But um, in terms of lyrics, um, uh, most of the lyrics that I had written were, you know, when I was still in high school, and I just kind of kept them over time. Um, uh, when I was in school, you know, I always d did, like, the English AP, you know, math AP, not part of the math, part Asian, a little bit of stereotype, but <laughs> anywho, um, in my English class, I mean, you know, I was always, you know, I was always fascinated with, uh, in particular, like, a lot of the, um, like, vernacular and wordplay and literary elements and poetry and stuff like that, so I really um, wanted to kind of be able to take three to five minutes and tell a decent story that can be deep in its own right but not really like 
too deep or too shallow, right? Mm -hmm. um, when it went to the first EP, it was kind of like, you know, concepts, diseases. For instance, sepsis, um, we had a, a bandmate in the past, and he kind of did us dirty in some various <laughs> ways, you know. Uh, some, sometimes stealing, sometimes goofing around during practice, not focusing at all, not retaining anything, chasing tail while we're on the clock. Like, come on, man. There's daytime and nighttime. That's nighttime, right? Mm -hmm. Come on, man. But um, so sepsis, of course, is, is a is, is basically like a blood disease, right? So it it fights against it. It, uh, it tricks your body into thinking that nothing's really wrong and tries to clot up your blood, but then it starts overclotting, travels, and then you can finally see it on your skin. You start going delirious, nauseous. You start hallucinating, and one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to die of a heart attack or whatever bit you is coming back for you. I took all of that and tried to metaphor the crap out of it into the relationship that that guy had from the beginning to the end. And does that guy know that that song is about him? I told him yes. Hopefully. <laughs> okay, good. So if it becomes big and famous, he can be at least he could at least tell his grandchildren, "Yep, they wrote that song about me because I was an asshole." Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, um are there any other themes that you like to explore in your lyrics or do you mainly just like to give make crowd pleasing songs how does that work well um a lot of them also are uh philosophical concepts one especially with center of the flesh uh i was kind of thinking about like you know honor and dishonor and you can live your life as honorably as you can or do the most messed up things you possibly can but either way the result is exactly the same which is the better route mm -hmm. center of the flesh in some way, shape, or form, tries to explore the paragon of both. In the first verse, it's like, a, you know, a knight of the medieval times dying by the sword on the battlefield was the most honorable thing that could possibly happen to you. Second verse, there's a dude in a motel that he's probably been squatting in, and they don't even know he lives there, just broken bottles everywhere, literally cursing and screaming at everybody else but himself for his own mistakes. My average right? Saturday night. <laughs> there it is. Oh my goodness. But, Shit happens, man. But, uh, the mo most intense one is our newest single. We just released this April 14th, and we just released the lyric video August 1st. So it's still relatively fresh. Um, the lyric, of course, the lyric video uh, has it printed down in the description, but it does follow along. Um, this is based off a true story, you know without giving any way of uh, the specific location or the specific name, we were basically uh, called to play this show, which is a benefit uh, at this you know, pretty cool cable party. There's a lot of pretty cool stuff there. Um, he actually set up a pretty big event. It went relatively well during the day, but during the nighttime, it got bad. So the oh, yeah. stories slash rumors behind it, you know, um, the facts, of course, this was a memorial show. It was for this guy's son who had passed away just recently. We didn't know how recently. We didn't know how he died. Part of the story slash rumors is that his son was murdered and was murdered for some pretty hardcore things, not just like accidental death, hair trigger reaction. It was like getting into some deep stuff, right? So, and then of course, another story slash rumor, it... The whole event took place literally a couple months after he died. Oh, wow. Very soon. Very, very soon. And that's such a traumatic thing to happen. So I think um, it might have been just a little bit too soon for him, for, for emotionally, right? Because especially if you're still knee-deep in grievance, right, your mind's not going to be all the way there regardless. You know, your better judgment's always clouded up by your emotion. Logic is panic spray, stuff like that. So, uh, what's the name of that song? What's that? What's the name of that song again? Six Gun. Six Gun. Okay, I just decided impromptu lead that I'm going to issue a challenge out there for all of our listeners. I will leave their group band page on their Facebook band page down below. The audience members can listen to that song, and you you message these guys on Facebook, and if you get the exact location of where this happened in, and these guys confirm it, and they can send to me the person that gave it to them, I will Venmo you $5. For all the audience members out there. So that is a challenge there. I will make sure to repeat this at the end, but this is we're trying to spice things up a little bit, okay? So make sure you listen to this guy's songs, and then you try to get, guess the location of where it was at, and they will confirm with me if you got it right, and I will Venmo you $5. Is 
if that's all right with you guys. That is perfectly yeah. fine. Yes. And, uh, the only catch, the hint was given to you a couple minutes ago. You might have to listen closely. But all the information is there. We live in Texas, and it happened around a certain mm-mm, look a couple minutes back. <laughs> he actually mm. said what more or less where it more happened. More or less. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He kind of said where yeah. it was, but yeah. Damn yeah. it. Okay, well, I mean, I guess first person that sees this that in comments gets the five dollars. Okay, I stay with I'll stay with my word. Okay, even though I just realized that I just shot myself in the foot. But uh, <laughs> thanks for listening anyway for the person that wins the five dollars. So um, <laughs> so one of the things that we also like to talk about, probably our most popular thing besides the five questions that we'll do right after this, but is performing live. I mean, all the musicians that I've had on here describe it as a drug, unlike any other. Just um, being able to play music in front of an audience and just have them show their appreciation to you. I mean, it, everyone describes it as making making everything worthwhile. All the practices, all the shitty hours that you guys might have to, you know, work on stuff. And this this goes for all four of you guys. Just We'll go around here and just describe individually what that feeling is like for you and how important it is to you performing live. Uh, well, me, I go first. Uh, Joe, go first. Okay, I go first. Uh, I think when we're live... It's like it's a bunch of different things, but I think one of the main things is just being, just being in front of people that have never heard your music before, and you're just seeing how they react to it, kind of, you know. And like the reaction will be like, the reaction will either be they're gonna stare at you with a blank face and like bob their head sometimes when the beat drops, or they're gonna like, it'll be like a crazy reaction and they'll start like I don't know hardcore <laughs> dancing or or a bunch of other stuff, but like. Just being able, I think it's just being able to influence people. Like we had a fan message us like a couple days ago, to, like letting us know that she got shot by her like ex boyfriend, and like she's she's like like happy she's alive, and like she's been listening to our music and it's been helping her deal with like the stress and the pain from that. And we're just like, yeah, that that blew my mind. Yeah, it just to be blew our um, mind. You know, just being able to have an impact, having our music influence people, is like a big thing. That whether that be on stage or off stage, that's for me at least. So, that was it. Uh, mine would, you know, people just say like being a musician, you know, you're in front of the crowd, you give the energy, they give the energy back. I didn't really understand what that meant. You know, I just went on stage and had a good time. You know, we just, we all enjoyed ourselves, had a blast, everybody clapped, you know, jumped, whatever, backflip, broke their fucking nose, whatever happened. <laughs> and we're like, all right, cool, it was a cool show. Now I understand it because we can, now when you're looking, like you said, you know, you got some people kind of standing there like this, standing off in the back, the fact that they are there taking time to watch us play, whether you're up front in the mosh pit, whether you're in the back, you're at the bar, you're in the shitter, whatever you're doing, you're at our show and you're watching us play. And that right there is the feeling that makes you feel that you're doing something good. You know, you're making an impact on these people because you're you're keeping them at the show. You know, like in Austin with Sixth Street and stuff, there's so many bars lined up. I mean, one that we play at quite often is called the Dirty Dog. And they literally have windows that are open, so I mean, even if you just want to be an asshole, you can stop in the in the deal and just look in the window and see the band. You don't have to pay to get in. Right? Yeah. Four hours for free. Yeah, we can sit there, <laughs> and it, it's so cool to watch those people look for a second and then come in, pay the cover to come watch the band because yeah. they want to support you. They want they're they're interested. But just to see that and see what's going on is it's a good feeling. So that's the that's the energy that we can you know, mm-hmm. or play tennis with. <laughs> that's the energy that we can word play tennis we play tennis we give the energy they give it back Rico with me <laughs> alright so um with me I don't know it's weird first off I'm wearing contacts right now and I have to wear glasses right so if I'm wearing glasses and I have to take them off during stage I can't see anything so for me that kind of makes things a little easier because it's like oh I'm just jamming out by myself there's really cool accompanying with me right have you ever have you ever fallen over without your glasses on performing live I have stepped on my glasses I have kicked them down to the stage floor and luckily my girlfriend was there to actually pick them up before they got destroyed unplugged your fucking guitar I haven't plugged my own guitar okay first of all how do you unplug your guitar when you're without <laughs> were you just like reaching for something and then you just were like oh this this works like boom. how'd that work right. oh it's like it's like there's so many chords around my feet i yeah. just trip up one by accident oh so yeah yeah it, right <laughs> but um light. but of course you know but i digress anytime when i can actually see you know and i can actually fully enjoy it the one thing that always captivates me right it, it always gets to me is whenever i walk you know having a little bit of a, a different tangent here. But whenever I watch a live performance with a band 
and the audience is singing their words. For some odd reason, that's like the best thing ever to me. Mm -hmm. That right there is that simple juxtaposition for me, basically what sums up the whole event. Like everyone gets to enjoy it together. And the cool thing about live performances, and yes, it's, it's, it's good to play your absolute best when you're live performing, but it's not 100% the game. You get to do a little bit of jump in, and sometimes you'll miss a note when you jump. You get to do a little flip, sometimes you'll miss a whole bar when you flip. When you're telling the audience, fuck you, or count down and having them hold the Fuck you, buy our music. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's we all get to enjoy it together. And as time goes by, we get more and more people, and I can actually start hearing it now, singing the songs with us. That right there, I to have a little bit of a sensitive moment, I actually do well up a little bit. I start tearing up just a little bit. That for me, that for me is worth it. That that whole, just that little section. It could be five seconds and everyone's singing and it just makes my whole night, makes my whole week. Something like that, it's just, it's just amazing for me. It's worth it no matter what. That's your other and it drops. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, do you guys better give him shit about it once the show's over that he, that he was crying or welling up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, get real mean after this. Oh yeah. Okay. Tell me. All right, Ringo. Next song. Don't cry. I was gonna say my goal with this podcast is to break up at least one band during the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's not gonna be this one. It's not gonna be this one, but one of these days. One of these days, hopefully. <laughs> you did what with my girlfriend? Oh, oh, bro. A fight ensues like mid podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Who was that? <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. It's like uh, everything they pretty much already said, but for me, the feeling of just being on stage, it's extremely calming. You know, a lot of people get real nervous. They get up, they got all these people laughing at them. But I get anxious before we go on. And then as soon as I get up, I see everybody. I see all the, the, the faces out in the crowd. It's It, it, it calms me down and lets me focus on just performing the best that I can because all these people came out to see four Joe Blows on a stage doing Joe what the they want to do. Joe, Joe and the Blows. Joe and the Blows. <laughs> do you get nervous, but then you realize I'm the bass player? What do I have to be nervous about? <laughs> <laughs> I can't see anything. <laughs> I had to throw that last bass player joke. We're done with bass player jokes now. I had to do it. He gave me too good of an opportunity. I ha I couldn't let it pass. But uh, now, Toby, um, what would you say is uh, your guy's most famous or most popular song that you guys have written? Oh, man. it's a. I think it's a toss-up between Breaking the Silence and the, uh, the new single, Six Gun. Uh, they're both fantastic songs. We wrote breaking the silence years and years, years and years, years ago it was the years. first thing we had written and it's just okay. been picking traction ever since yeah so i'll definitely make sure to leave those two songs in particular down below but uh now we're going to the everyone's favorite part of the podcast the five questions the inside the actor's studio-esque as always we're going up to episode podcast 50 i think we'll go up until and then i'll tally up all the answers and then see who's got the most votes we are at well this is now going to be the 30th for bands because we had a nutritionist on and we'll be having a few more uh different professions on here as we try to mix it up a little bit but musicians and bands will always be my number one focus believe leave you and me it's to the audience members out there but uh for the first question and this is for all four of you guys to answer uh if what is one song in the history of music that you wish you would personally come up with yourself <laughs> we'll go this way oh i'll go first um that's fuck, tough. man <laughs> i don't know uh Dang. well if we're if we're not going in a circle then fuck, um, fuck her gently tenacious d <laughs> That right there. That's the that's the that's the wingman song. That yes. song is the wingman. You don't need no one. I wish that man. was the first song I had ever written. To be honest. Oh. I just I just I my dream would just to have that song playing on like a Walkman at a bar and then just oh, walk God. up walk up just blaring out or have like a jukebox just like on my shoulders or whatever just playing that that that's the ultimate right there. Ever have the if you're ever lucky enough to walk into a karaoke bar and hear somebody singing that with like 80 people in the karaoke bar, one of the best experiences of my life. Next time I'm doing open karaoke, I will request that song. So, yeah, Zonovan. Oh, fuck, man. Africa for Toto. 
Yes. <laughs> Perfect one. That is the second Afro from Toto, by the way. So Toto is Afro slowly uh, working its way uh, up. And drop C. <laughs> 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 I don't think it would work very well. Oh, yes, it would. You can transpose anything. Fact. Yes. Mm. Hashtag Tama. <laughs> nope, this, the song that I think I would have loved to have for myself would be right for myself would be uh oh let's say byob system of a down mm -hmm. that song is so freaking frantic it's so awesome but what's what's funny about system of a down is like even though they're like slightly comedic you know they all have very musically inclined backgrounds and everything's actually very well constructed yeah, so but... in terms of in terms of composition it's fun it's goofy and i like to be fun and goofy right but it's still frantic and hardcore and it has its mellow moments. It's like the cornucopia of everything that I've ever liked in a song. That's the one I want. Mm -hmm. If I could, if you could auction that to me, that'd be great. <laughs> Get in touch with Surge. <laughs> 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 I want that song. <laughs> oh, man. Um, for me, if I could have written a song, it would have been Carry On My Wayward Son by Kansas. Yes. Oh. I don't care what anybody says. That is the oh, most perfect man. fucking song. I'll put that, it on YouTube on the yes. way home from work. Can I, can I, just I, jam it. Oh. No, you can't change it. Can, yeah. I, can I retract no. mine? I got I got a real one this time. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't it? I said I said a tenacious D solid. There okay, was Toto no... was a joke. My legit oh, song, no, honest no. to God, can't go back. It's probably no. Stairway to Heaven. Oh god. Okay, yeah. that is the I... first that is the first Stairway to Heaven mention. I am surprised that it took me thirty musical guests on to have that, but I think it's some it's so it, that's so it's someone almost everyone's answer that like you're the first person that had that's had the balls to say it though, so I appreciate it. <laughs> what Toto or? Stairway to Heaven. For Stairway. Yeah. Yeah, no one has said Stairway to Heaven yet. I am surprised, but yeah, okay. Yeah, carry on my wayward son, too. I mean, one of... one of no Stairway. What, yeah, exactly. One of probably, like, the 50 like most perfectly written songs ever. It just plays like a dream. Now, question number two. Out of all the musicians, dead or alive, doesn't matter, you can pick dead or alive. Um, if you could perform live with one person or band, who would it be and why? Queen. Freddie freaking Mercury because it's Freddie Mercury. Mm -hmm. I don't need to answer that. Justify. It has no justification. It answers itself. It's Freddie freaking Mercury. All right. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, being from Texas, I'm going with Dimebag yeah. and Pantera. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Rest in peace. Rest in pieces. To him and being. With uh, with me. I'm a huge sucker. I'm a huge sucker for Silverstein. You know. These guys are probably tired of hearing it. We played a we played a couple covers. Smile, I've, uh, sweet. Oh my god! I, if Shane told from Silverstein, and here's here's the catch though, I have technically jammed with him. I've never performed with him, and I would freaking love to. But I have jammed with them on their tour bus when they came with Memphis Makefire during their Rise Up tour. Oh wow! Alabama City Music Hall, San Antonio. That's pretty dope. My yeah. girlfriend. I love her to death. She set up the whole thing for me. It was a it was a birthday slash anniversary gift, and we brought them donuts on the hoose. <laughs> on the hoose. <laughs> on the hoose. On the hoose. Eh? Hoos, eh? He's like, don't don't make fun of my. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone that knows that they're so He's like, don't do that. <laughs> for me, I since we're just giving in to like our guilty <laughs> pleasures, I would. <laughs> I watched a video of this kid play Unholy Confessions with Avenged oh, Sevenfold on stage. That was probably the best thing in the world to me. So, <laughs> I would love to go on stage and play uh, play a song with with them. Yeah, absolutely. they're all pretty laid back, so I think that'd be awesome. All right. So, did we get everyone's answer for that? Boom, 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 boom. Okay, yeah. good. All right. So, for question number three: Out of all the venues on the planet, if you could play at if you could play at any venue, where would it be and why? And disclaimer: Like I always have to say, Red Rocks has already won this contest, but I'm still asking the question anyway. It's gotten eight votes, and I can. The next closest is, is three votes, and I'm not even going to say it because I, 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 who knows, it might catch up to it. But Red Rocks is obviously – I got pissed off because out of like the first 18 episodes, like eight of them were Red Rocks. And I was like, okay, this is BS. I got to change this. So Red Rocks, <laughs> I looked it up. It's a great venue. We all get it. But other than Red Rocks, what is the one venue that you would play at if you had the chance? Can we do tours or does it have to be a specific venue? It can be whatever you want. Okay. I'm going with Bring Back Mayhem Fest. Mm -hmm. And – We'll play the whole fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just everything it touches. <laughs> everything. Uh, but no, one venue. Um, Donington. Mm -hmm. Donington? Yeah, ACDC. 
Yep. There you go. That's a good one, actually. Um, LBC, Long Beach, California. It's a, a really huge stadium-esque venue, and for Event Sevenfold, funny enough, with their Diamonds in the Rough LP live in the LBC, it came in a DVD package. That's when I got to see, like, of course, the overhead shot of the venue, and then I got to see pictures of it when it was empty. So I'm like, that looks amazing. Mm -hmm. I want that. I have to say the LBC, too. That's the first thing that came to mind. So, Because of Ensemble. Double vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> judge uh, me, I don't care. You're judged. <laughs> um, I can't think of any like specific venues, but... God damn it, Toby. <laughs> that was my second choice was Bakken. Bakken, 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 Bakken was my second choice. Three Literally. Days. That's just... That's yeah. the dream. So Bakken was like all of our second choices? What the heck? Literally Why do we all just say Bakken? Bakken was my second choice. Bakken was All right, so we got Bakken down. All right, now here's where we get to the real sweet and sour. Guilty pleasure songs. What is the one guilty pleasure song that you think that you guys in the band or just your fans in general would never guess that you enjoy? Oh, man. Oh boy. We all listen to pretty wild stuff. I don't think we're going to surprise each other. But and no I'm... Nickelback. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> no Nickelback. No Nickelback. Uh... <laughs> oh my goodness. Man, for me, anything by Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, how is how is Elvis Presley guilty pleasure? Come on. <laughs> Elvis is just uh, actually my parents are actually in Graceland right now, so that's pretty dope. Uh, nice. Now, one specific song aside from Elvis. Hmm. Probably Regulators from Warren G. Huh? Regulators. Oh, I never guess that. <laughs> That's actually one of my riding songs. I love it. Nice. Okay. Anyone else got theirs? Or do I have um, to say mine? <laughs> we'll save you for last. Yeah, no, sure. uh, shit. Guilty pleasure song? It'd have to be uh, sold Grundy County Auction by... What the hell is his name? Abba? No, no, no. <laughs> John Michael Montgomery or something like that? Jason Michael Montgomery? Yeah. Something like that? I know what you're talking about. I love that song. All That's right. also on my rotation on YouTube. Heck yeah. <laughs> you gotta go, Rico. I'm sorry. Oh, man. <laughs> You're no. doing something like I'm, I'm like no. flipping through my atlas right no, now. Uh, like no, no. Boys and girls, George. do y'all remember back in the day when a guy by the name of uh, Usher <laughs> was still oh, big? Oh, man. God. Oh, man. That's so, yes. For me, for me, it was... <laughs> These are my let's see if I can... <laughs> You're gonna steal it from me. No, it was a. Uh, oh man, it was burn. It was let it burn. Let you gotta, it burn. I love that song to death. And uh, of course, like the majority of my family, from like both my mom and my dad's side, kind of has that sweet spot for that old, you know, Usher. So I, it kind of stuck around with me. <laughs> love me some Usher. All right, and sure. lastly, guilty pleasure genre that you enjoy. Lo-fi. That is my guilty pleasure oh, genre. Lo-fi. I don't so know good. if that's if you're even saying it right. It's all over YouTube. Check it out. All right. You're yeah, studying. You're it's really good. You're 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 yeah, uh, like doing recreational drugs. Cool. Lo-fi is like the most chill music in the world. I'm gonna get that lo-fi pedal, and it's gonna be in one of our songs. No. Yes. Um, <laughs> not <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's for me at least. No, for me, it's electronic music. I love techno, hardcore. Dubstep, all of it. I don't care. <laughs> all of it. Like, oh. I've been on a wicked hardcore trip lately. Like EDM hentai. Yeah, you know? yeah pretty much. <laughs> hentai? EDM hentai. What? Uh, it's, it's amazing. It's like a soundtrack. Oh, or? isn't that the name of the song? Yes. Uh, hentai. Uh, what, the, what, the, what did I just discover? Like, <laughs> oh my god. Rico's gonna be like, oh god. So, uh, control shift and <laughs> and. <laughs> Anywho, um, I guess my. Guilty pleasure, and that's the thing that sucks. Which is the one thing that I think of that would just be the weirdest? <laughs> I know I have a thing for like, uh, like a lot of uh, like Japanese traditional instruments. Yep. I love the Japanese traditional, uh, you know, instrumentations okay, and scores, and uh, whether the actual music or scores for film and video game, especially video game. A lot of Japanese. Um, Classical Japanese uh, scores have sounded really good, but there's this band, actually, Wagaki, band? Wagaki yep. is my new guilty pleasure Wagaki. because they are a mix Wagaki of band? traditional Japanese and modern rock. 
Mm. It's amazing. It's really good. If y'all get the chance. Didn't I show Wagaki. you that? Um, I actually stumbled upon it, but you, you told me what the name was, and I was yeah, like, thank you! Ba- a little, little blurb for Guilty Pleasure Band for me, Asian Kung Fu Generation. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard of them, yeah. Yeah, I love that band. All right. All right. So now, lastly, here, uh, where can people find your guys' music? Do uh, you guys have Spotify, YouTube, uh, iTunes? Uh, where can people find you? We have SoundCloud, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube. We even have, I think, songs on Facebook somehow. Ins- <laughs> Instagram links on Instagram. Do you go on what is it? Amazon Music. Amazon, Amazon Music. Title. Pandora. Our own website. Bandcamp. You can play our songs Bandcamp. on our website. Pretty much like anything you can think of. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, I'll make sure to leave links to all that stuff down below. And uh, do you guys have any shows coming up that you would like to plug? We have a show coming up next Saturday. It's going to be at the Jack's Bar in San Antonio. The event's called Local Disturbance 2018. We're going to be playing with bands like Narwolf, Cold Casket, Shattered Sun, Kingdom Collapse, Brotherhood. The King, Brotherhood, and so on and so forth. It's a yep. big event. Um, uh, August of- 11th. Martin. Anyone in the area, come out and wish me a happy birthday. It is his birthday, yeah, too. His birthday, birthday show, awesome. San Antonio. Forget August 11th. Be there. <laughs> <laughs> Be there or he'll cry. I will cry. He will cry. I'll make it happen. More oh, than okay. more than he already does. Be there. What was that? More than he already does cry every day being the <laughs> bass player. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the last jab. <laughs> there's the last jab. I had to do it. So, um, other than that, you guys have any shows coming up? Another one is going to be September 1st. September 1st. It's going to be in our hometown. Parker at, Heights, Texas. Parker Heights, Texas, at a bar literally called The Bar on Veterans. <laughs> <laughs> it's right by a uh, pool hall called Rackham. All right. So that's what it'll be. Um, and then, of course, October 13th, Dirty Dog Bar. And hopefully, Come and Take It Live December 1st. That's going to be fun. Headlining show at Come and Take It Live, Austin, Texas. Very first one there. Hopefully. Very excited about it. Very no, excited. it's not hopefully. It's happening. It's, it's going to happen. It's We've, already, happen. We've already gotten the details. Sorry, but... Right, uh, <laughs> <we're just excited. laughs> the Dirty Dog is also in Austin. Just All let right. me be a On 6th Street. All right. All right, yeah, I'll make sure everyone get those dates a shout-out, and, I mean, definitely check these guys out. They have some great music coming up, and, I mean, as you can see, they have, definitely have the camaraderie of a band that's going to be here to stay. So, um, I mean, these guys are really, you know, I really personally enjoyed, we enjoyed having you on, and, I mean, we wish you nothing but the best in the future. You guys have any shows that you want me to promote or whatever, you let me know, and I'll give them a mention on here. You guys have any songs being released, I'll give them a mention down here, and uh, I'll have all the links to all their stuff down below, so everyone go and check it out. The final Five dollar challenge. I know I screwed myself and shot myself in the foot, but please make sure to message these guys that answer, so then I can give you your five dollars. And um, yeah, I mean, you guys have any uh, any last things that you'd like to say? Uh, never home. give up. Never give up. Never give up. Take your, take your catchphrase, Donovan. Go low or go home. Go, go low or go home. That is a great, great catchphrase. Now, uh, once again, this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing out and with the band restriction and. Uh, We wish them nothing but the best, and uh, have a great night, everyone. Later, man.